For those of you that don't know, I'm Mary Jones. I'm the Executive Director. And we have a guest tonight for you, Dana Phillips, and I'd like to welcome her. Uh, we have had a very busy summer. It was, it was really weird because some days it'd be busy, and some days we'd sit and gossip all day. So that's the kind of summer it's been. Um, the water is a problem, and yet people want to come down here and see what it's all about. So it really, it's odd that it does draw business as well as turning business away. So we are working hard. We've got next season all planned. We've got our programs all the way up to April. Some really good programs. I'll just give you a brief um, history of what we're doing. October will be Steve Vitale and the old Colorado Inn and all the places that he's bought on Seminole Street and turned that into a beautiful section of town. Um, November will be the Whitakers. We're looking forward to them coming in and giving us a program and they're gonna bring some paintings with them. I, they may even have some for sale. Uh, December is our open house at the museum. Um, and Linda, Gary, is she here? She's having a birthday party for her father that day, but all of you will get the information in the newsletter. Um, January, we're having Josh from the Jupiter Lighthouse do a program on Trevor Nelson. Uh, February, it's uh, a program on Nora Zeal Person by Adrian Moore. In April, it's the Schaefer Murders, also done by Adrian Moore. And April and May, I'm still working on. So it looks like we're going to have some really good programs. And I want all of you to come out and join us and be welcome. And right now, I'm going to turn it over to Dana and let her give you her program. Thank you. I'm going to try to use, not use a microphone. Can everyone hear me okay? If I speak like this? Thanks, but I appreciate that. Um, my name is Dana Phillips, and I am excited to be here this evening. I will really thank you very much for coming out on a Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. What a beautiful view. What a beautiful building that we have this venue to learn about who is Jonathan Dickinson. Um, before I start on what the story I want to tell you about. I would just like to just take a moment to remember what occurred 17 years ago and that we keep uh, their memory in our hearts and our minds. Uh, close to 3,000 people were killed, 6,000 people were injured, and so let us be mindful. Uh, with that, again, I'm Dana Phillips. Uh, I want to tell you about myself and how I got involved in this story. Uh, it's it's an amazing story. Some of you uh, in the audience, are, we've got some serious historians here amongst us, and so I, I'm going to be challenged this evening by your wealth of knowledge on this as well. But I want to first explain that what I'm doing tonight is to tell you a general story about Jonathan Dickinson, a true event that occurred right here on our beaches 322 years ago. It's a fascinating story. I moved here three years ago. I wish I could say I was like many of y'all that lived here locally your whole lives. What a beautiful place. I moved from Charleston, South Carolina. The first weekend I was down here, I asked my husband to take me to any of the local museums so that I could learn about this local history. Uh, Stewart Heritage Museum was one of my first stops. I explained that I just moved here from Charleston and I don't know anything about the area and they said, oh, you need to read this book. Some of this, this book might look familiar to some of you. I said, well, okay, you know, I'll, uh, what happened? And he said, well, there was a guy that got shipwrecked here and the only place he could get help was if he walked all the way to Charleston. And I thought, well, I just... I just drove nine hours from Charleston. How did that possibly occur? So that's the hook that caught me right there. So I started reading this. Now, when I say it's a very hard read, it's a very hard read. 
It's in journal form. It's 300 plus years ago. It's kind of like old English. Uh, it's, it's not flowing. It's, it's, it's where Dickinson just simply jotted down uh, daily events, the weather temperature, the wind, what he was thinking about, brief little snippets. So it was really hard to get into. So I, I'd open it up, I'd read some, and I'd put it down. And then I'd get a little farther along and I'd find some amazing fact that was interesting that, that caught my attention. And months later, six months, eight months later, my book turned into rat or tear uh, research through. And so I was fascinated by the story, absolutely fascinated. And I didn't know why anyone else didn't know about it. Uh, it's kind of like if you lived in Boston and you didn't know about the Boston Tea Party. It's that big. And I was, I was just kind of blown away about it. So I, I went to uh, my closest library to, to my house, which happens to be Florida Classics Library. Some of you might know of a gentleman named Mr. Val Martin. Um, he is uh, an amazing um, historian, uh, sells local books, and he was the only person that knew about this. And so we would spend hours talking and talking and talking and talking and talking and talking. I thought, I can't believe this is such a great story. And I said to Val, why don't more people know about it? And he said, I don't know, maybe it's because it's a hard read. And I said, well, maybe someone should write something so it's an easier read because people up here in Stewart in the 50s and 60s and 70s were reading that book and they knew that story. But our society has changed over the years and we're less likely to sit down and read a book. And Val looked at me and he said, well, you better get busy. And he put the task on me. So uh, all I did was talk to people like yourselves. What are you looking for? I, I heard, I mean, we need pictures. Tell us the story with pictures. And, and so I, um, I wrote and illustrated this book so I can better explain this hard story. However, I do challenge all of you to try. It's great. Um, okay, so we're gonna have to go back in time for me to get you 300 plus years back. Uh, everyone's familiar with going over the bridge, we look out the inlet, we're trying to see is it blue water, is the tide going out, are boats getting out today, how beautiful it is. This is uh, an important uh, slide for us to continue to remember as we go back in time. This was what the inlet looked like prior to being the lighthouse being built. So it was very common for people to travel up the coast of Florida, past Georgia, to go to their destination. And they knew in their minds, if they were to get shipwrecked, uh, this is what you're gonna be digging, you're gonna have. This is, there's nothing there. There's not a, a place to find water or food. It's just a primitive wilderness in the mid-1800s. Some of you are familiar with the House of Refuge. I want to just take a moment to, to tell you a little bit why this is important. They, these buildings were built for one purpose, and this is in 1876. The one purpose was those people who choose to get on a wooden ship and travel up the coast, if by chance they shipwreck and survive, the chances are very slim that they're going to survive the elements of this primitive area that we live in. The House of Refuge had people there that their simple job was to get up in the morning and walk north and walk south to see if there was any survivors of shipwrecks. Jonathan Dickinson did not have that option. Uh, let's go back in time a little bit more to 1861, 1865. Everyone here is familiar with the Civil War. This is a baseline for how we're traveling backwards in time. This is where the first shot was, was sent off into Fort Sumter. And we could do the next slide. This is where in 1861, Abraham Lincoln elected your 16th president. Why is this relevant to our story? Next slide. It's because in 1860, the lighthouse was finally being completed. Meaning, when you drive over that bridge next time to look at that blue water and see if boats are getting out and how the tide is, I want you to remember, right as Abraham Lincoln was becoming president, was when this area kind of began to evolve. 
Prior to that, next, it was very, very primitive. Native Americans lived here and survived and thrived. It, the lighthouse was being built in a, in a jungle, in a, in a wilderness that the um, soldiers that were working on it had to stop several times because of mosquitoes and the, the heat and the, the malaria that was going on. So we got to go back some more to get to John Dickinson. There in the inlet, if you have been to the Du Bois house, the Du Bois house is built on top of an 11,000 year old midden. That's M-I-D-D-E-N. -D -D -E think of it like it's a large trash pile. This is where for 11,000 years, natives thrived in this inlet. They fished and they, they had families and they had communities and the trash or the bones or the, the, the bow and arrow that snaps and breaks, they just kind of throw it into a pile and it just keeps getting bigger and it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And this is a great cross-sexual, sectional reference for us to think about what our community is and it is today. This also is a sign of plaque down there that verifies <coughs> John Dickinson's uh, journal and, and so forth. All right, so let's go back another hundred years to why we shoot fireworks, eat hamburgers and hot dogs, and celebrate the birth of our nation, the Declaration of Independence. Um, 1776 seems like a long time ago, but it really isn't. I was just talking about 11,000 years. We're a young country. Uh, 1776, we got excited to declare ourselves as an independent country. And this is all still relative to Jonathan Dickinson. So, Jonathan Dickinson, this is, let me tell you about the guy. He's, he lives in Port Royal, Jamaica. He's a wealthy merchant, meaning he was buying and selling and trading goods. He was a gentleman. Uh, his father uh, had two plantations. Uh, they were wealthy. Uh, and could live forever in Port Royal, Jamaica, a thriving port. I need you to compare it to the, the Boston. Uh, they, they were sending goods back and forth and back and forth. Why would Jonathan Dickinson want to leave? We need to think about why, why would you? We need to think of Jonathan Dickinson as a human being just like any of us. Why would you want to consider traveling to the new world when you have to worry about a few real issues. One issue, you're going to trust your wooden ship is going to take you on this passage for the next few months and that the people that you're traveling with are going to make sure you have plenty of supplies. Number two, pirates are real. This isn't Disney characters. It's not fun and games. These guys' full-time job is to steal and take everything away from you and if you're lucky, that's all. Three, we need to consider weather. Now, we can predict um, our hurricanes coming in, or our weather patterns, or we can, our uh, phones go off, or the news comes on, and it tells us. Dickinson's time, they had no idea. There was a general idea, but they had no idea. So when you're on a wooden ship, maybe being attacked by pirates, and you don't know what kind of weather you're traveling into, just simply because you want to go to the new world, you got to have a, a real inner drive, especially since today we're looking at these images of a major storm hitting the Carolinas and Virginia here in the next 48 hours. Think of that fear. It's real. One reason uh, Jonathan Dickinson might have considered leaving Port Royal to come travel to the New World was there was an earthquake five, four years prior to him leaving. An earthquake that was so devastating that it took the entire island of Jamaica, two-thirds of the island, <coughs> underwater. Try to imagine. Out of nowhere, buildings are falling into the water. There are hundreds, if not thousands, who have been killed. The, they don't have places to bury them. There's disease running rampant through the city. There's dilapidated buildings that are crumbling and falling as we speak. There's 
thirst, there's hunger. Uh, it's, it's not the place you want to be, the mosquitoes, the heat, the, 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 the horror, horror of your town falling into the water. D uh, Dickinson's family uh, had a merchant shop on the, on the uh, harbor uh, that had mild damage. Uh, the two plantations inland were fine. So Jonathan Dickinson really kind of came out of this unscathed. So why would he want to leave to come to the new world if he's okay, if he's doing pretty good? That's a decision that he kind of rumbles with for four years and then finally comes to the conclusion that he's ready to take all the risks to come here. Again, pirates are real. Uh, if you were traveling in a ship and you had a flag up that represented Spain, for example, a pirate ship might be looming off the harbor that sees your flag and then they're gonna hoist their Spanish flag and sneak around and come sneaking, get close to you and take all your belongings. This was real, it was scary. Now, this is what Jonathan Dickinson and people around the world knew about Florida of the time. It was primitive, it was jungle, it was Native American, different tribes who they were considered possible cannibals. Now, they, all they had was floater reader things that were coming into town that they could read a pamphlet on. So maybe it was not factual, but it's what they believed in their heart that if you get shipwrecked, you're in the jungle with primitive Native Americans who possibly could do the most horrific things. <clears throat> These are a couple etchings um, that Dickinson might have been looking at back in that time. So people across the world, for different reasons, are wanting to come to the new world. Jonathan Dickinson is wealthy. He's not having to deal with religious persecution or he's not having to deal with running for his life. He just simply wants to. Some people were coming over to the New World <coughs> as what was called in, indentured servants, meaning if I am poor and I have a religion that goes against my country and I want to try to make a life for myself in the New World, what I can do is I can go sign up my name to work for you for six years where you're going to be in charge to make sure I have shelter and food and then other than that I do whatever it is you want me to do. So some people were coming over to be indentured servants to get their free ticket to come to the new world. Dickinson didn't have to worry about that. Here's an example of bustling ports all over the world at the time. This was uh, an industry. This is where the gentlemen and ladies and and, and the merchants were tra trading and selling and making lots and lots of money. It was busy, busy, busy. Here are some examples of different routes into the New World. The Dutch, the English, the French, Spanish, Swedish, Russians. This was common. It's kind of hard for me to imagine that it's common for me to get on a wooden ship and set sail uh, for the next few months and not know about pirates and, and, and storms. All right, so this gentleman, William Penn, some of y'all might ring a bell with him. He has something to do with Jonathan Dickinson. William Penn, uh, he had an idea. It was a radical idea at the time. He had this idea that he was going to create a community where all of us are going to live peacefully as one. We're not going to shoot the Indians. We're going to live amongst them. We're going to call ourselves the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers. He's the one that decided to uh, create this colony in Philadelphia. Ironically, his father and Jonathan Dickinson's father, Jonathan Dickinson's father, were friends, and so we can only imagine that Dickinson is sitting at his table on his plantation in Port Royal as a young boy listening to these two older men discussing religion and politics in this new way of thinking 
and his father may be giving him some influence to say, why don't you go to the new world and start up our family business? And your brother will stay here. So William Penn had a radical idea, not only being friendly amongst Native Americans, but they wanted equal rights for women as well. It was a new way of thinking in 1696. So this is where the story begins. Here we are, it's Jonathan Dickinson, the morning of August 23rd, 1696. Here's where we can imagine he's waking up, he's so excited, he's been thinking about this for years, and finally he's made all of his arrangements to gather all of his belongings and go to the new world, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A lot of planning went into this. There was a law that prevented anyone from just hopping on a boat and taking off to wherever you want to go because the dangers of pirates. So if you want to go somewhere, you have to organize a group of ships. So that is called a frigate. So Jonathan Dickinson organizes with about a dozen other ships and they make a decision after their planning and coordinating that they're going to all go together. I question why in the world it's in August. We all, they, they had a gist, they had an idea that this is when there's dangerous waters. But keep in mind, pirates knew that the ocean's pretty calm in the summer and that's when people want to travel. And so if you want to travel, they're going to catch you then. So maybe, he, maybe, maybe it was that. So, Jonathan Dickinson, his very young wife, Mary, and his six-month-old son, Jonathan Dickinson, Jr., decide to board their ship, the Reformation. We can only imagine what Mary's thinking about this. She didn't have a journal, but as women, we're, we can relate to her and say, are you sure, honey? Are you know, we really gonna take the six-month-old on this trip at this time? But nonetheless, this is what they decide. So we can all imagine, 25 people. We've got the captain and the, the mates and the, uh, he's got a couple friends with him. One's a preacher uh, and he did have a handful of slaves that he did bring over. Um, you can imagine them. the sun is shining, the winds are blowing, the seagulls are calling off into the air as they leave their home of Port Royal on their new adventure to the exciting new world. Their plan was to leave Port Royal scoot up around Cuba, move up the coast of Florida, and arrive in Pennsylvania in November, just in a couple months. Maybe making some stops in different ports to reload on supplies, but it's a pleasant trip. This is very important. Jonathan Dickinson decides to keep a journal. Now, with a quill pen, a little dab of ink, he makes little, little brief entrances into his journals, somewhat stating uh, today weather is this and the winds were that and we saw Cuba off to the distance and it, it's just basic stuff. But without his journal, we would never know the story today. So it's very important that he's done this. On September 23rd, middle of the night, he's got in his journal, he's written down a big wind. Now, a big wind is what people in the 15 and the 1600s would state in their logs when it was a possible hurricane. How big of a wind, how big of a storm, we don't know because they always said a big wind. It was big enough to separate him from the frigate who continued travels up the Gulf Stream to their destinations. They also mark in their logs Reformation went aground, middle of the night, September 23rd. Here's where I'd like you to try to imagine the fear. The wind's howling, the, the rain is pelting, uh, it's pitch dark, the stars are shining, screams, uh, the, 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 the wood ship is abruptly being pushed uh, and, and dragging along the sharp edges of the reef. Frightened to death, they finally come to a stop and they help each other off and they kind of count, is everyone here? And of course it's still raining, you're sopping wet, you're exhausted from all of this 
and they start gathering their belongings and trying to assess what are we going to do. We kind of have an idea that we've landed in the middle of this wilderness primitive jungle and possibly will become subjects as captured strangers on their lands. As they assess their damage and gather their belongings, they started to hear new sounds, things they weren't familiar with. Sounds of the jungle, sounds of frogs, cicadas, gnats, the mosquitoes are all over them. They're just trying to gather their thoughts. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What they don't know is that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of natives of Ho Bay are watching from behind the mangroves and the palms, assessing what they're going to do with these strangers. See, they're, they're so far in South Florida that they didn't really see white strangers very often. They had met, they had interacted with Spanish to some degree, but this was very strange and they felt very threatened and annoyed by this. But Dickinson doesn't know. Following morning as the sun's coming up over the horizon and they're trying to gather their thoughts of what to do, these hundreds and hundreds of natives of Hope Hay come charging down out of the dunes. Dickinson writes in his journal that they sound like howling wolves. They're screeching and they're screaming out and they're snatching their belongings. Dickinson's party, a few of them, the men, they pick up their rifles to defend themselves. And Dickinson says, uh-uh. Put them down, we're outnumbered. So as they're taking their belongings, the natives start to scream, Nicolier, Nicolier, Nicolier. Dickinson says, I don't know what you're talking about. He's, he's the English, and he does not know their language. They do not know his language. They're screaming Nicolier because they're trying to ask, are you English? They don't like English. Eventually, Dickinson says, Philadelphia. They don't understand either. There's a language barrier. Next one. Not only do they take all their belongings, but they also strip them of their clothing. So here you are, thirsty. You've survived the shipwreck. <laughs> You're hungry. You haven't slept. You're scared. The fear has just got to be taken over you. You have to be bitten up by all these mosquitoes and, and, and you're uncomfortable as a gentleman, wealthy merchant uh, going through this experience. Your feet are blistered as you're walking over all these hot sands. If you're familiar, if any of you are boaters, if you're familiar with Pex Lake on the intercoastal, the exact location of Jonathan Dickinson's shipwreck that evening is on the, up directly on the other side. So keep that in mind, because they marched them from that area all the way to the inlet, Jupiter Inlet. That's a long walk. They marched them down, and here's where the natives are angry. They're not, they're not anything less than uh, snatching, grabbing, pushing, pulling, uh, knife point. Their intent is to take them to their king. Uh, there is a name that is used amongst American, uh, Native American tribes, and it has different pronunci pronunciations. This is particularly, uh, as Dickinson states in his journal, his name is Kasaki. They're taking him to Kasaki, and depending on Kasaki's mood, you're either going to live or not. Here's where Dickinson writes in his journal, the way the community of the natives of Ho Bay uh, are living. In his journal, he doesn't talk about the Ais and the Wegas, so that's why I keep, continue to refer to the natives of Ho Bay. Here's Kasaki and his cheeky hut where he is discussing what to do, what he wants to do. Um, this is where they see that the natives uh, they don't grow crops. These natives are not growing crops of corn for harvest later. If you're hungry, you get your net or whatever your pole and you go catch anything. You catch everything. You're eating sharks and stingrays and uh, mackerel and conchs and oysters and 
anything that happens to be in the inlet. He also describes in the book that the way that they prepared those fish. Sometimes they would smoke the fish. Uh, it's important to make a note that they did not waste anything. So any of the fishermen out here that are proud of their catch, they know that they have to go home and clean the fish. The natives did not do that. So there was everything that was thrown into the pot of which they would boil the water. And everyone can think about how bad that's got to be. Uh, and they would boil everything. And as the hundreds and hundreds would fill their belly and feast together, at the end of the day, Dickinson notes in his journal that Kasaki offered they could have the leftover boiled fish water. Now, at this point at the journal that I'm reading, I'm like, geez, like this is the part where he's going to complain. This is the part where he's going to say something. Uh, and he says, no, he says, uh, you know, blessed be to God that I've been given some uh, nourishment uh, to last another day. Mind you, Mary, his wife, is trying to nurse and keep this baby alive. Um, the, there's talk in the journal about uh, the women would snatch the infant from her and they would take turns nursing the baby, which made Mary cringe. But at the same time, she wasn't producing milk, so she got over it and she started being thankful. They did not know if Jonathan Dickinson Jr. was gonna survive. They didn't know if the Native Americans of Hobe wanted to keep the baby with them and raise it as a Native American. It was a day-by-day -day, uh, fear. Uh, it was harsh, yet I, I, I want to pause just to say how, how, how beautiful it must have been to be a Native American on the inlet with your culture thriving for so many generations in, 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 in such a beautiful, pure way. So it is something to pause and not think of them as um, bad people. They were simply being reactive to these strangers on their land and they didn't know what they wanted to do. One last thing is Kasaki, interestingly enough, had an interest for all, their, all of their belongings, but also fine clothing whether he was gonna trade with Spanish maybe, or whether he was gonna wear it maybe, that's part of the reason why they stripped them of their clothing. Because if we're gonna kill you, we don't want holes and blood-stained garments. How about that? So thank you for that with Cassidy. Yeah, go ahead, Robert. At night, uh, Dickinson describes in his journal how the hundreds would gather and they would celebrate, and they'd have a big bonfire, and he talks about how, again, they're howling like wolves they're screaming. Meanwhile, Dickinson and party are trying to just survive a night, try. Uh, there is no shelter. So some of us, let's put this in perspective. So at night when you're sitting on your back porch under your screen in patio, drinking your glass of iced tea or whatever, and the gnats start biting and they chase us back in the house because we can't take it. Not five minutes of it. These guys are sleeping, uh, they have to dig a hole in the ground to try to get away from the gnats and put any kind of palm fronds over them just to survive another day. Meanwhile, the sounds of the natives in the background. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a minute by minute, day by day, way of surviving. Don't forget about your wildlife that's all over the place. Bobcats, panthers, raccoons, snakes. You're in the middle of the jungle. Eventually, they are able to get away from Kasaki and the natives of Ho Bay. Now, I would like you to consider if you happen to be in Jupiter Inlet, you've survived the shipwreck, you've survived being captured by local Native Americans. Where are you wanting, where are you able to go if you need help? You're thirsty, you're sunburned, you're lost weight, you're where are you gonna go in 1696 to get anybody to help you? St. Augustine. St. Augustine. So start walking. It's a long walk, it's 200 miles, and this is where Dickinson and the party of 25 start up the coast to find any help. At this point, this is where, unfortunately, some of the party start to die off. The weak can't keep up with the group, 
uh, the, the, the healthier ones are trying to bring and care. You're my friend. We've done this together. We're trying to help you out. She can't. And so this is where they start to pass away. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Uh, you had a little technical. So this is, um, when you think about them walking, at, well, you're like, how did they cross an inlet? They crossed the inlet because they had to come inland and they, they would follow along ancient Native American trails where they would follow in to where the river got more narrow, where they could cross to follow the Indian trails to get back up to keep their direction. If I get to St. Augustine, and uh, St. Augustine, they're used to this. Remember our stand, uh, stranded uh, shipwreck survivors went to St. Augustine. And so often St. Augustine would take you at the doors and say, great, we'll feed you and we'll give you some water and here's some, you know, bit of shelter, but now we're gonna just kind of keep you captive as our slave because we need you to help build our St. Augustine fort. Ironically, they had finished building their fort about a year before Dickinson showed up. And so they said, well, here's a little bit of water, but we're a Spanish colony and you're English. So you can't, you're not doing any advantages <coughs> for us, so you need to keep going to the next English colony, which happens to be Charlestown, Charlestown, Charlestown South Carolina. So glad you made it those 200 miles, but now I need you to keep moving another 300 miles. We will be nice to share with you some of our Yemisi <coughs> Native American tribe to take you in their dugout canoes up the rivers of Georgia, along the marshy seagrasses of the low country in which we are going to then cart you into Charleston Harbor. Here Charleston Harbor is a thriving English colony and they had heard word that they were finally coming here. These, the, the city erupted in celebration. You have survived, you're a hero, you, you know so much information that we don't know. Come in, the governor says, you can stay at my plantation, we'll put you up, and you can stay, this is around December, then they said, you can stay till the spring, we want you to be fed and clothed and, and, and celebrated here in Charlestown. We'll give you a new wooden ship and set you back up to your destination of Philadelphia in the spring. April 4th, 1697, finally arrived in Philadelphia. They're so happy. Uh, the friends of society are, are rejoicing and bringing in their friends and they are overjoyed by uh, that God had helped them get through this journey. Uh, Jonathan Dickinson, um, finishes up his journal, and he shows some of his closest friends. And they're like, this is just amazing. You need to publish this. And he's like, no, no, this is just for my friends. And finally, they convince him, you know, let's publish this. Now, Philadelphia at the time is so young, it doesn't even have any a printing press. So he has to wait a couple years, but he finally gets it published, and we'll come back to that in a minute. Dickinson, our Jonathan Dickinson, who survived this shipwreck and walked our beaches, was so well-loved in Philadelphia that he is elected mayor, 1712-1713. And again, he's elected in 1717-19. He raises a family. He has a prominent home. He becomes a merchant again, buying and selling goods out of the port. He's thriving. He's mayor, re-elected. And at this point, his journal is starting to cycle out into the country. And then it's starting to find its way over in England and in Port Royal and all the places around the world. Now, why do you think his journal becomes a bestseller around the world? It's because if you're thinking about leaving England or wherever, and whether you're an indentured servant or whether you're wealthy, and you want to be a part of the new world, you're reading his book. It's a sensational, like Native Americans, the shipwreck, the 
possible pirates, the weather, and you just can't get enough because you are ready to make that step yourself. It literally becomes a bestseller around the world 322 years ago. Here's an example of an advertisement for it. Here we see our Quaker friends helping each other, and we see our Native American friends, and, and it was advertising, and it was uh, trust uh, to come here. Uh, people around the world are reading it. It's, it's hotcakes off the shelf. Uh, I was able to find some old copies because obviously this has taken over my life for six months or eight months just because I'm so excited. And I think, ooh, if I can get my hands on like a first edition, that would be just awesome. I'm so excited. And I find one for $30,000. <laughs> Of course, I look over to my husband as it's a consideration, right? And he said, no, it's not. But the, the idea, the reason it's $30,000 early edition is because it is that important to our early America. It's, it's our pioneers. It's our, the people that came here uh, and fought uh, all kinds of uh, adversities to, uh, to make it. They have leather-bound copies that were being printed out in the 1700s. Um, if you were, think of it, if you were, let's say you were in the early Americas in your two-room log cabin, and you have your table and your chairs and your basics, and you have your little bookshelf with your Bible there, there's a good chance you probably have that sitting there as well. If you are a plantation owner and you're wealthy, well, I'll take the leather edition, to show my wealth and my knowledge. Here's different examples of different printings over the last 300 plus years. It's printed in different languages. Uh, there's different titles because they kind of would, you know, change it up to, to tell you the story. Sure as help for defense. I'd like to read to you. Oh, first, yes. So why do we know that this happened, the shipwreck happened right at Peck Lake on the other side, on the beach side? Why? It's been, hmm? Evidence. evidence, yes, we have evidence. So when the ship wrecked and they were gathering all their belongings and the natives came charging down taking all their belongings, Jonathan grabbed his journal, tried to keep it, and one of the other uh, men grabbed what's called an astro lake. Now, why did he want this? It's because he needed to know his exact location so he knows exactly where he's got to go. So he quickly takes the astrolabe and he gets away just a short enough amount of time and he lifts it up to the horizon to take his measurement to know exactly where they are. Natives pull their bows back because they think this is a weapon. What are you pointing at? What are you doing? And they pull their, and this is where Dickinson writes in his journal, we had saved one of the master's quadrants in Seaman's calendar with two other books. As we walked along the bay, the time suiting, our mate, Richard Lintney, took an observation, and we found ourselves to be in the latitude of 27 degrees and 8 minutes. Some of the Indians were offended at it when he held up his quadrant to observe. One would draw an arrow to shoot him, but please God, hitherto, to prevent them from shedding any of our blood. The 27 degrees and eight minutes, that's it. And if you know how to read maps, that's all the information you got and you know exactly how to pinpoint it. Side note, for those of you who know Val Martin, wonderful gentleman, I went and talked with him one day and said, um, wow, geez, I wish we knew where they landed. I wish, where, where is the shipwreck? Where did they, where did they land? And he goes, oh, that's on page 11, right by the second paragraph. He knew exactly where it was. I sometimes hesitate to tell people exactly where it is because there is no marker for the shipwreck. It's on um, federal preserved property. So if you're planning on taking your, um, your treasure hunting cap and, and try to find some gold, you will get arrested. Uh, I don't believe there has been any official archaeological dig out there. Well, it's, it's there. It's, it's there now. The coast has changed over these hundreds of years, but there's that there. So that's why we know. 
because he risked his life to point back to the horizon. My question to everyone as we talk about this real life human being true story is I would like you to put it in relationship to your own lives. When you're thinking about a rough day, I tease students when you're thinking about all the homework you have to do. You know, at least you don't have to walk to St. Augustine. You know, like put it in perspective. As I was doing a lecture at a, um, a yacht club, and the gentlemen uh, were sitting in the audience, and I said, so y'all fishermen on your nice big boats with the twin engines and your Yeti cup and your Yeti cooler and your slathered up, don't be complaining that it's hot or too buggy. You know, let's put it in perspective a little. Um, next slide. So this is, his, this is the last paragraph he wrote in his journal. And I think it's a great way for him, you to sum up his overall way of thinking. Thus having completed our hard passage hither, wherein God's great mercy and wonderful loving kindness hath been largely extended unto us in delivering and per preserving us to this day and time, I hope that I wish all those of us that have been spared hitherto shall never be forgetful nor unmindful of the lowest state we were brought into, but that we may double our diligence in serving the Lord God is the breathing and earnest desire of my soul. Amen. This, that's how he, that, that's the whole, that was his whole attitude, the whole, the whole way up. Um, next. When uh, technical difficulties are fun. Um, so I want to kind of come to a close to let you know what happened to Jonathan Dickinson um, once he's established, he's mayor, he's doing well. He ironically got back on wooden ships from Philadelphia and went and took it back down to Port Royal, Jamaica. Um, he did that to visit his family. He took his wife and his three children at that point, and he would travel back up. And, and that was a, there was a mindset to that. It's something we don't necessarily have today, and it's common. You'll hear this, these two words, you'll hear it when you study about Jamestown and Roanoke, early 1600s Americans. It's called God's providence. It's a, it's a, it's a way of thinking. Uh, it has a negative, you know, positive side to the thinking. It says if it's God's will that I have survived, and it's God's will that I will continue. Or it might be changed around to say, well, we showed up and all the natives have, you know, died of disease, and that was God's providence. It's a way of thinking. So we can't really say that Jonathan Dickinson was brave and courageous. It was just he had a mindset to move forward in his life. And that's why he went back to Port Royal and back again. And he did the tri trips a few times, and the pirates finally caught him. <laughs> they finally did catch him on one of his trips back, and he said, okay, I quit. I'm not doing this anymore. But with that, I appreciate you very much letting me share with you um, an important man that happened here. Um, and to also make one last note that being that it was a bestseller in the early 1700s, his book, his journal, we can consider that some of our early pioneering fathers, Ben Franklin, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, perhaps had read that story as they grew into men and then decided to form the words in pursuit of happiness on a document that we live by today. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to 